Hello children. Today I am going to continue with the topics of uh, moving charges and magnetism. So I am going to start from the first topic. Torque on a current loop placed in a magnetic field. So what we are going to discuss? We are going to derive an expression for the torque acting on a rectangular current carrying loop placed in a magnetic field. So once again I am going to assume a rectangular loop A, B, C, D. Say it carries a current I, it is suspended in a magnetic field. Under this condition, what happens to that rectangular loop? The loop will experience a torque and as such it starts rotating in the magnetic field. So we are going to get into the concept and also we are going to derive the expression for the torque. So uh, let us get into the derivation. So I am going to consider a rectangular loop, you are able to see. A, B, C, D is a rectangular loop. It is suspended in a magnetic field. What about the direction of magnetic field? The magnetic field acts in the plane from left to right. So once again, what about the uh, direction of magnetic field? The magnetic field acts in the plane and you are able to see it acts from left to right. So I marked the magnetic field for each arm of the rectangular loop. You are able to see very clearly. Next, let each arm carries a current I, obviously the loop carries a current I as shown. I am going to say I is the current flowing through the rectangular loop. Next, let the normal to the plane of the loop. So you are able to see this is the plane. Normal means obviously this will be the line. I can say this is normal. So I am going to say this is n n dash. I am going to assume obviously this is the line drawn normal to dA. So once again let the normal to the plane of the loop makes an angle theta with the magnetic field. What I am assuming normal to the plane of the loop makes an angle theta with the direction of magnetic field. Similarly here also I can represent the same. Say I am going to say it is m m dash. What about the angle made is theta. So obviously you are able to see, you just focus on one arm, say dA. So dA is a conductor I can assume carrying a current I is placed in a magnetic field and already you know when a current carrying conductor is placed in a magnetic field it experiences a force. So what about the direction of force? I am going to assume F1 will be the force on this arm, F2 will be the force on this arm, F3 and F4 respectively. So let us get into the direction of F1. So what about magnitude wise, what about the force acting on the arm dA can be written as I dA vector cross B vector. What I can write is I dA vector cross B vector. You know I wrote it from the formula F vector is equal to I L vector cross B vector. You know the formula for forces bill sin theta in vector form. It is I L vector cross B vector. Here the length is dA. Obviously here L is dA. So for that I am writing I is equal to dA vector cross B vector. Let us suppose that the let AD is equal to BC is equal to breadth B. Similarly AB is equal to CD is equal to L. Obviously it is a rectangular loop. What about I am assuming AD and BC are equal, I am going to take it as B breadth. What about the length AB and CD, I am going to take it as L. So obviously you are able to see what is the formula I am going to get is F1 vector is equal to I B cross B vector. Obviously this is the magnitude uh, vector form. Now let us get into the magnitude form. So what about the magnitude form F1 can be written as you know the cross product is removed it will be b i b sin theta you know theta is the angle between the current element and magnetic field to be very clear you can't put theta directly you are going to see from the diagram what is the angle between the current element and magnetic field you are able to see this is current element and this is magnetic field so obviously the total angle will be 90 plus theta so what i can write is sin 90 plus theta so it, it ultimately becomes B I B cos theta. Mark it as equation number 1. Let us explore the direction where the force F1 acts. So I am going to represent it first. Then let us explore the reason for this. The force acts in the plane 
towards upward direction where the force f1 acts it acts in the plane in the upward direction how you can use the vector product rule you keep your fingers along the direction of ida vector you keep the fingers along the direction of ida vector curl the fingers such that it moves to b because you are going to turn the fingers from ida to b you keep your fingers along the direction of ida and the curling of the finger towards b and you are able to see clearly the force acts upward in the plane once again it's a very simple rule to get the vector product direction i am going to use the right hand thumb rule you are going to keep the fingers along the direction of the first vector then curl the fingers so that it moves in the direction of the second vector so obviously thumb will indicate the direction of the resultant here the resultant is the force so what about f1 vector is it is acting in the plane upwards similarly what i can write for f2 for this arm bc directly i can say since it has the same denotation what i can write is it is also bib cos theta mark it as equation number 2 where f2 acts once again by using the same rule f2 will be acting in the plane downwards so i'm going to write it as f2 vector now you are able to see clearly the two forces they are equal in magnitude opposite in direction with same line of action the two forces f1 and f2 they are equal in magnitude opposite in direction but their line of action is also same as a result of which what happens the two forces cancels each other this means there is no effect of f1 and f2 on the rectangular loop now get into f3 and f4 what i said f3 is for the arm ab and f4 is for the arm cd so what about f3 i can write in vector form you know f3 is i can directly write i i assumed ab to be l so directly it is il vector cross b vector you write in scalar form it will be f3 is equal to directly you are able to see the angle is 90 bill sin 90 sin 90 is 1 so directly f3 will be b i l so once again you are able to see the normal is along the length so obviously the angle is 90 degree so f3 will be b i l only let us explore the direction of f3 using once again the vector product rule you are able to see what i said you are going to keep your fingers along the direction of current element so this is the direction of current element you are going to turn the fingers as that it moves to the second vector that is b vector so you curl it obviously it moves to b vector the thumb will indicate the direction of force this means it is perpendicular to the plane and towards the reader what about the direction of f3 obviously you are going to keep the fingers along the direction of flow of current you curl the fingers such that it moves towards b so obviously this should be the position of the finger then only when you are going to turn this it will be moving towards b for example if i am going to keep uh, in the plane like this maybe may not be getting the curling finger in the direction of b so to be very clear you stretch your fingers along the direction of current you curl the fingers such that it moves towards the direction of b the thumb will indicate the direction of force so what about the force it is perpendicular to the plane and towards the reader perpendicular to the plane means obviously it's a three dimensional figure so i'm going to mark it is like this this is f3 vector similarly by exploring in the same way what about the force on the arm cd will be f4 vector mathematically by magnitude f4 will also b b i l so we are able to see very clearly f1 and f2 are equal in magnitude opposite in direction having same line of action they cancel f3 and f4 are also equal in magnitude opposite in direction but their line of action is not same the line of action is not same so they are not cancelling but ultimately they give rise to a torque since f3 and f4 are equal in magnitude opposite in direction with different line of action it gives rise to a torque and due to this what happens to the loop the loop starts rotating in the magnetic field so our next case will be what will be the torque developed on the loop so once again i'm going to explain the entire content our aim is to find the torque on a current loop placed in a magnetic field for that we assumed a rectangular loop a b c d 
it is suspended in a magnetic field uniform magnetic field what about the direction of magnetic field the magnetic field acts in the plane from left to right the magnetic field acts in the plane from left to right so i marked b vector for all the four arms next let a current i flows through the loop as marked you know ultimately uh, the normal to the plane of the coil we are assuming makes an angle theta with the magnetic field this is also a very important part the normal to the plane of the loop makes an angle theta with the magnetic field so i represented on the two arms next so you know a current carrying conductor i can assume the arm to be a current carrying conductor suspended or subjected to a magnetic field you know it experiences a force so i am assuming what about the forces on the arm ad is f1 bc is f2 ab is f3 and cd is f4 let us get into the magnitude and direction of f1 what about f1 is you know force on a conductor in a magnetic field is il vector cross b vector already we derived this on the last class it is il vector cross b vector here l is da for that i am writing i da vector cross b vector i am assuming da and cb to be the breadth and the length ab and cd to be the length l so i can replace da with b vector cross b vector now when i am going to write in the magnitude form it will be bib sin this is a very important part sin theta actually it is but you should be very clear this is the angle between the current element and the magnetic field current element is here the magnetic field is here so obviously this is the entire angle you are going to take so obviously it will be 90 plus theta so what is sin 90 plus theta is cos theta so what i am going to get the magnitude for f1 is bib cos theta next similarly what about the force on the arm bc it will be f2 it is also magnitude wise same that is bib cos theta what about the direction of fn and f2 from vector product rule it acts in the plane upwards it acts in the plane downwards they are equal in magnitude opposite in direction with same line of action so they cancel the effect of each other now let us get into f3 and f4 f3 is the force on ab arm and f4 is the force on the arm cd magnitude wise f3 is il vector cross b vector obviously the normal is in the line itself so obviously the angle will be 90 only so it is il b sin 90 il b sin 90 is simply b i l what about the magnitude for f4 also it will be also b i l now since the magnitudes are equal they are opposite in direction but they are not in the same line of action so they have different line of action as such the loop experiences a torque this means the loop starts rotating in the magnetic field now we are going to derive an expression for the torque in order to derive an expression for the torque i am going to assume uh, some part of the diagram that already we saw i am going to assume the arm ad only obviously i am going to assume the plane that is ad only you are able to see the, out of the entire loop i am assuming ad only this is the direction of magnetic field you know the magnetic field acts in the plane from left to right in addition you know what is normal to the plane of the coil we draw that is n n dash i think you can easily recall n n dash it makes an angle theta with the direction of magnetic field now what about the two forces that is left one is f3 i think you can easily say because f1 f2 cancels off this is f3 vector and similarly at d what is the force that acts is f4 vector i think uh, you can easily recall the entire loop was suspended in a magnetic field four sets of forces acted on the loop f1 f2 cancels off where f3 and f4 is the only effective that gives rise to the torque so i draw only the part that is ad so a is subjected to f3 point d is subjected to f4 now what is the expression for the torque we know torque is either force into perpendicular distance what is the formula for torque is either force into perpendicular distance the perpendicular distance between the two forces that can be obtained by a construction so i am going to draw a construction you are able to see this will be 90 degree so this i am going to mark it as k so the perpendicular distance between the two forces will be dk f3 is acting at a f4 is acting at d the perpendicular distance is dk so what i can write is either force is bill and the perpendicular distance is dk so how to get dk if this is theta geometrically this is also theta and this is the breadth so this means it will be b sin theta i think uh, trigonometrically you can easily use this so what about the final form 
B i L into d k is B sin theta, you know length into breadth is area. So, I can write it as B i A sin theta. Say the loop has n number of turns. So, obviously, I am going to make n also. So, B i n A sin theta. So, this is the torque experienced by the rectangular loop placed in a magnetic field that is tau is equal to for simplicity I am going to read it as B na sin theta that is B i A B i n A sin theta. So, once again in order to derive an expression for the torque what is the formula for torque is either force into perpendicular distance what is either force is B i L perpendicular distance is obtained from the geometry that is d k represents the perpendicular distance. Geometrically, dk will be b sin theta, length into breadth is area, if I am putting n number of turns, tau becomes b na sin theta, that is b i n a sin theta. So, this is one form of torque acting on the loop, I am going to modify the form in terms of uh, some other angle. Let the plane of the loop makes an angle alpha with the magnetic field, obviously theta is something else, alpha is something else, theta is the angle between the normal to the plane and the magnetic field where alpha is the angle between the plane and the magnetic field. So, let us suppose that alpha is the angle made by the plane of the loop with the magnetic field. So, geometrically you are able to see theta plus alpha is 90. Theta plus alpha you are able to see 90. So, theta will be 90 minus alpha. So, you can put here. So, tau becomes B i n a sin 90 minus alpha you know it is cos alpha. So, obviously, these are the two different forms of torque acting on the rectangular current carrying loop suspended in a magnetic field. Theta and alpha are two entirely different angles. Theta is the angle between the normal to the plane with the magnetic field, whereas alpha is the angle between the plane of the loop and the magnetic field. So, to, while doing numericals, you should be very sensitive whether in the question theta is given or alpha is given. I am going to get into my next topic that is basically it is the application of what we studied now. What we studied now, whenever a rectangular current carrying loop is suspended in a magnetic field, it experiences a torque. On that principle, we are going to discuss a device called moving coil galvanometer. We are going to discuss a device called moving coil galvanometer. Moving coil galvanometer is also sometimes called D. Arsenal galvanometer by the name of the person. It is also called American type galvanometer, but commonly it is a moving coil galvanometer. So, let us get into what is the principle behind the working of a moving coil galvanometer. You know what I said, whenever a rectangular current carrying loop is suspended in a magnetic field, it experiences a torque. On that principle, this moving coil galvanometer works. So, once again, what is the principle behind the working of a moving coil galvanometer? When a current carrying loop is suspended in a magnetic field, it experiences a torque. On that principle, the moving coil galvanometer works. So, let us get into the constructional details. You can focus on the diagram. The diagram is uh, very clear, I think. I can get into one by one what I am going to say. The very first is you can focus the diagram, it consists of a rectangular coil, you are able to see, it consists of a rectangular coil A, B, C, D, we are able to see the marks A, B, C, D. Obviously, what is a coil, you know, coil is nothing but it is consisting of number of turns of insulated wire wound over a soft iron core, that structure is called the coil, the middle part you can see in the diagram that represents a rectangular coil A, B, C, D. It is suspended between two strong pole pieces of a permanent magnet, where it is suspended, it is suspended between two strong pole pieces of a permanent magnet, you can see the shape of the magnet, concave shaped pole pieces are used, this is very one of the important uh, part of this device. We are going to discuss the reason why plane magnets are not used, why concave shaped pole pieces are used. Next you are able to see the coil is suspended from a T shaped hook. You are able to see the coil is suspended from a T shaped hook called torsen head. What is the name we are going to give for that head is torsen head and the wire that is used is phosphor bronze wire. What type of wire the coil is stretched from phosphor bronze wire and also you are able to see a small concave mirror is attached along the length of the wire. A small concave mirror is attached along the length of the wire. In addition, the base of the coil is connected with a small hair spring. 
obviously so that it unnecessarily oscillates to avoid that disturbance it is connected to the base through a small hair spring. The entire apparatus is enclosed in a non-magnetic case. You can see the diagram. The entire apparatus is enclosed in a non-magnetic case to avoid the disturbance of air. To avoid the disturbance of air. In addition, two sets of screws are given. In the base, you can see they are called the leveling screws. Obviously, they are the leveling screws to align the galvanometer. In addition, you can see on the two sides. T1 and T2, they are called the binding screws. Obviously, you are going to connect this galvanometer to a circuit. So, that T1 and T2, they are the binding screws to connect the galvanometer to the external circuit. I think this is the constructional setup of moving coil galvanometer. So, once again, I am going to explain the entire constructional setup. Uh, it consists of a rectangular coil A, B, C, D. Obviously, what is a rectangular coil A, B, C, D is nothing but it is consisting of number of turns of insulated wire wound over a soft iron core. Once again, it is suspended between two concave shaped pole pieces of a permanent magnet. It is suspended by a T-shaped hook called torsion head and the type of wire that is used for suspension is phosphor bronze wire. In addition, a small concave mirror is attached along the length of the wire. In addition, the base of the coil is connected to a small hairspring to avoid the unnecessary oscillations of the coil. In addition, the entire setup is enclosed in a non-magnetic case to avoid the disturbance of air. Two sets of screws are provided. Obviously, the screws you are able to see in the base, they are called leveling screws to align the galvanometer. In addition, you are able to see two screws at the sides. It is marked as T1 and T2. They are called the binding screws. The purpose of binding screw is to connect the galvanometer to the external circuit for which we are going to detect the value of current. I think uh, the constructional part is very clear to you. So, let us get into the working principle. How it works? Ultimately, I said it is working on the same principle what we discussed on the last topic. So, let us suppose that a current I enters the coil. A current I enters the coil. So, what happens when a current I enters the coil? Each arm already we discussed experiences a force. F1 on the arm AD, F2 on the arm BC, F3 on the arm AB and F4 on the arm on the arm CD. So, you are able to see already we proved F1, F2 they are equal in, oppo equal in opposite, they cancel the effect of each other whereas F3 and F4 gives rise to a torque. So, what about the deflection torque? What I am going to give a new name called deflection torque. What about the torque formula? You know tau is equal to either force. into perpendicular distance. Now, you can focus the diagram. Already we draw this diagram, but uh, that perpendicular distance was in terms of theta. What we discussed on the last uh, case, the perpendicular distance dk was in terms of theta, but here we are going to use alpha. Here we are going to use alpha. So, obviously the perpendicular di distance dk will be b cos alpha. So, either force is bill. Yeah, I can say it is n bill and turns into B cos alpha. So, obviously it will be P i length into breadth is area B na cos alpha. So, what is this? I am going to mark it as equation number 1. What is equation 1? This is the deflection torque developed in the loop when suspended in the magnetic field. Ultimately, alpha is the deflection. Here I am going to say alpha is the deflection or the angle with which the coil gets turned. I am going to mark it as alpha. Now, once again, this is the deflection torque developed in the coil due to the magnetic field. Now, you know a concept when the coil starts deflecting or rotating, the suspension wire gets twisted in the opposite direction. You should know. Obviously, the coil is suspended by means of a phosphor bronze wire. So, when the coil is deflecting, obviously, the suspension wire will be deflected in the opposite direction. So, a restoring torque will be acting on the loop that will try to oppose the deflection torque. So, what about the restoring torque? I am going to write is k alpha. Directly, I am writing restoring torque is k alpha, where k is the restoring torque per unit twist. k is the restoring torque per unit twist of the material of the wire. Once again, 
tau is the deflection torque beena cos alpha when the loop starts rotating the suspension wire gets twisted in the opposite direction and as such a restoring torque acts on the loop what about the restoring torque tau can be written as k alpha so at equilibrium i can equate the two so what happens beena cos alpha is equal to k alpha make a formula for i i can be written as make the shifting it will be k by n b a alpha by cos alpha k by n b a is a constant i'm going to give a name called galvanometer constant so i'm going to write it as g this entire term is a constant what is the name i'm going to give as galvanometer constant g into alpha by cos alpha so g is a constant so i can say i is proportional to alpha by cos alpha this means if alpha is the deflection i is the current they are not directly related they are not directly related because alpha is in the numerator also alpha is in the denominator also they are not showing a direct dependence since there is no direct dependence a linear scale of measurement cannot be achieved a linear scale of measurement cannot be achieved what do you mean by this for a scale the variation should be linear if one factor is increasing the other should be increasing if one is decreasing the other should decrease but here you are able to see if i is the current flowing and alpha is the deflection they are not directly related if they are not directly related this means a linear scale of measurement cannot be achieved so in order to achieve a linear scale we are going to modify the setup so you are able to see g is galvanometer constant and i'm going to get alpha by cos alpha in terms of proportionality if i'm going to write i is proportional to alpha by cos alpha what is alpha i said alpha is the deflection produced due to the flow of current i now you say whether i and alpha are directly related whether they have a linear dependence the answer is no because alpha is in the numerator also alpha is in the denominator also so obviously if i am going to make a linear scale of measurement a linear scale cannot be achieved because for a linear scale there should be a linear dependence if this quantity is increasing this should increase if this is decreasing this should decrease so in this concept we can't achieve a linear scale of measurement so what i should get i should get i proportional alpha i should get i proportional alpha and to achieve this the poles of the magnets are concave shaped to achieve this the poles of the magnets are made concave shaped and due to the concave shaped pole pieces i'm going to get a radial magnetic field i'm going to get a radial magnetic field with this i'm going to end my session take care of yourself